213. That's right. Uh, Jesus is coming again. Now it's time for our morning offering. We're not going to have a children's uh, story at this time, so we're going straight into our offering. And today's offering is for the Calexico Mission Schools. And our ushers will wait us on us at this time. Please stand. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you once again for this wonderful opportunity to return a little bit of what you've already given to us. Dear Lord, we thank you again for the quick work you've made of the sanctuary and how good it's looking. You are truly amazing and loving. Dear Lord, please bless this money and speed it to its use. We pray this now in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Now it's time to enter into prayer with our prayer song. Now, dear Lord, as we pray, take our hearts and minds far away from the press of the world all around to your throne where grace does abound. May our lives be transformed by your love. that are inclined to kneel, please do so. Dear Heavenly Father, as we went through this week, watched over by your love, we felt your presence, we felt your mercies. Dear Lord, in our day-to-day -day dealings, there is no doubt that you exist the many wonderful joys that you have given us in our lives, the many times you've answered our prayers, the many times that you stood by us and helped us through our troubles. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all these things. We thank you for sending your Son, Jesus, to this world to be a sacrifice to us, for us so that we can live and be with you in glory. Dear Heavenly Father, we know you hear our prayers, and we thank you in advance for your mercies and your love. And we pray this now in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Incline thine ear.
Today's scripture reading will be found in 1 Thessalonians. I'll be glad when we get to heaven and we don't need these things anymore. Amen. 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 6. Now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labors of pain of a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should come surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. Amen. Our song of expectation uh, the pastor chose goes along with the whole theme of, of this wonderful Sabbath presentation about our rich heritage and how God has led us from the very beginning until today and will lead us through the end. And this song uh, I, I never heard before, and my husband suggested I Google it, and it brought up the picture of Ascension Rock from where the people in uh, 1844 thought that the Lord was going to return. And um, it brought up other p uh, pictures of our heritage. So when you go home, if you Google the title, you'll see that and you'll get to hear a professional singing it. And um, we're just going to, it has a rich heritage. It was from millennial age, 1843. And it was sung as an Advent home by Jane, uh, song by James White. It was arranged in 1984. It was given a new arrangement by Wayne Hooper, who arranged a lot of songs in our canon of songs. We're going to sing the first and fifth uh, verse as a congregation, and um, we'll give it a go. <laughs> Okay, it's time for our children's story, and our children's story will be brought to us by Stan or not. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I was asked to tell a story about William Miller, and uh, just happened to have the book uh, by Paul Gordon, who was an undersecretary at the E.G. White Estate. I actually had the privilege of hearing him speak at camp meeting, and I actually had a conversation with him. But uh, William Miller was born, lived about 200 years ago, and his father was a uh, teenage soldier in the Revolutionary War. He himself was an officer in the War of 1812, and he his men, about 5,000 or so, went up against 15,000 British. And the Americans beat the British. And... This is William Miller, not his dad who did that. Or no, that is his dad, right? His dad was in the Revolutionary War. Right. 
he was in the War of 1812. Okay, so this is William Miller, the one that was 5,000. Right. And <clears throat> at the time, you know, he, he had a godly mother, and he got associated with some deists and kind of fell by the way. And, uh, but he was a respected, upright person. He was actually became later the Justice of the Peace and uh, held a lot of respectable positions. But uh, he, um, kind of got estranged to some degree to religion. But when he came to this situation in this battle, he was very impressed that God was delivering this country like he did Israel of old. He found that he was a very intelligent man and a very logical mind and he just could not reconcile. I mean, his army was facing certain destruction. And uh, so that really impressed him, kind of turned his life around. He wasn't satisfied with the deist ideas. And uh, finally, uh, he returned to, to God and made an intense study of the Word of God and became convicted that something was going to happen in 1843 or 4. And <clears throat> that was, a, he began a study about 1816, studied intensely for two years and became quite proficient at the Bible. And uh, time went on. Uh, he wasn't a public speaker. And uh, years later, 1831, he was strongly impressed that he should share what he discovered in the Bible. And um, he had begun to share his ideas with friends, personally. And so one day, August 1831, after breakfast one Saturday morning, he went to his study to read the Bible. He had regularly shared his belief with his friends, uh, but never in preaching. As he was studying this particular morning, the Lord again seemed to be speaking to him. Go and tell it to the world. Miller writes about it this way. The impression was so sudden and came with such force that I settled down into my chair saying, I can't go, Lord. Why not seemed to be the response. And then all my excuses came up my want of ability, etc. But my distress became so great, I entered into a solemn covenant with God that if he would open the way, I would go and perform my duty to the world. What do you mean by opening the way seemed to come to me? Why, said I, if I should have an invitation to speak publicly in any place, I will go and tell them what I find in the Bible about the Lord's coming. Instantly, all my burden was gone, and I rejoiced that I should not probably be thus called upon. For I had never had such an invitation. Miller continues the account. In about a half an hour from this time, before I had left the room, a son of Mr. Guilford in, of Dresden, this is New York State, about 16 miles from my residence, came in and said that his father had sent for me 
and I wished and wished me to go home with him. The young man, Miller's 16-year-old nephew, Irving, had traveled 16 miles by horseback, rowboat, and walking. He told Miller that they had no preacher for church services in Dresden the next day. And his father wished him to come and share with them what he had learned on the subject of the Lord's coming. <clears throat> young, <clears throat> young Guilford had left home with a request for a preacher before Miller had made his promise to the Lord. Reminds me of the Bible text, before they call, I will answer. While they get speaking, you will hear. Miller was angry with himself. He left the boy and went to the maple grove near the house. His six-year-old daughter, Lucy, watched her father go out of the house and followed him. But her father's actions convinced her that she should not stay. She hurried back to the house, announcing to her mother, something's wrong with daddy. Miller remained in the grove for nearly an hour, struggling with himself. He finally settled the question, returned to his nephew, who was waiting, and agreed to go. After dinner, they arrived in, to Dresden, where he preached the next day to a group of who had gathered at the Guilford home. Describing this first sermon, he said, as soon as I commenced speaking, all my diffidence and embarrassment were gone, and I felt impressed only with the greatness of the subject, which, by the providence of God, I was enabled to present. Miller was invited to stay for meetings the entire week. They were transferred to the Dresden Church for more room. Families came from several towns around, and revival began of thir 13 families attending. Only two persons were reported not to be converted. When he returned home the following Monday, Miller found that the pastor of Pulteney, Vermont, had sent him another invitation to preach. <clears throat> this town had been his first home after he and Lucy were married, the pastor, Elder Fuller, would become the first minister except Miller's message of the second advent of Christ. After this, invitation seemed to pour in from every direction. From the start, large crowds came out to hear the farmer and justice of the peace preach on the second coming of Christ. Revival and Reformation followed wherever he went, he soon had twice as many requests as he could answer. <clears throat> Miller's love for the Bible grew in his study and with his study and preaching. Writing to a minister friend, he spoke of this love. I want to see you more than ever, and when we have less company, so that we can sit down and have a good dish of Bible together. In the same letter, Miller spoke of the need of a pastor at the local Baptist church. Some of our people want a quick gab, but I should prefer a quick understanding. One never remained in doubt about what Miller said, and so William Miller had begun his public preaching. His ministry would eventually bring at least 100,000 people to the commitment to the same Jesus that Miller had accepted as his personal Savior. Thank you, um, Stan, for sharing that beautiful story. Um, also, um, it's sort of a, a lead into uh, my sermon today. My sermon is going to have some visual aids uh, along with it. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for this beautiful a day that you've given to us in this beautiful place that you provided for us to come and to worship. You help us to truly understand what it means to worship. Um, send your spirit, Father, to touch our hearts and our minds. We ask these things in your name. Amen. 
First of all, just before I begin, I kind of need to give sort of a, a, I guess, a preparation for what I hope we can experience here. First of all, um, if you are alive and breathing this morning, you are both a utopian and you are also a millennialist. Um, you probably haven't heard those words very often, but the, the concept of utopianism, folks, began the moment Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. They were kicked out of the garden. And from then on, all humanity has been searching for that garden, that perfect place to live, that perfect environment with perfect people in the presence of God. Do you all fit in that? <laughs> I hope so. And, and, if you're, and if you're one of those people that's continually looking for the better uh, community to live in, the better town to live in, the better state to live in, the better woods to hide in, the better cave to, <laughs> to live in, you are truly a utopianist and a millennialist. Okay? Now, I don't want us to confuse millenarianism and millennialism. Those are two different things. What, what Stan prov- uh, presented for us is those who followed, followed William Miller were Millerists. Okay? They were a group of people who believed and understood what he was saying, that Jesus was not coming to this world to establish his kingdom on this earth, and specifically in America, but he was going to come and take us from this earth. And you need to understand that because that is so important, so vital for us to understand the time period that the Advent movement grew out of. If you understand that, then you will understand the incredible switch that went on in the 1800s in America. And not just America, England and even parts of Europe. It went from being God is coming to this earth to build his kingdom here and specifically in America, okay? And then the idea that Um, versus the idea that God is coming and he's going to take us out of this earth to the kingdom. Do you see the difference? Does everybody understand what we're talking about here? Okay, so so with that in mind, um, I'd like to just sort of begin. This morning, imagine if you would, and, and you may have to go back in your minds, if you have to close your eyes and think about this, you're going to travel back a ways, over 100 years back in time. In the history of uh, Christianity and in the history of America and also parts of Europe. Everywhere across the landscape, you could see little dots of light, sort of like fireflies in the woods. You ever seen fireflies? Blinking here, blinking there. These were groups of people on their way to a nearby mountain or nearby hillside. There was much excitement, much fervor. And as we, as we watch these groups of people walk, making their way, we begin to hear above the barking of the village dog, we hear songs of, of praise, songs about the coming of Christ. And as we listen closer, we hear even some that we recognize. I'd like to suggest the one we sang this morning probably was sung at that time. James remembered it and probably wrote it down. But he may have written it too. But the point is, there was people all over the world that were now looking forward to the coming of Jesus. And more specifically, because of the preaching of William Miller, they were looking for the coming of Jesus in the clouds of heaven, and he was going to take them up into the sky, into the kingdom of heaven. Now, not everybody believed that, because some people held firm to their their religious beliefs or held firm to their convictions, and they insisted that God was going to establish his kingdom here on this earth, that the kingdom of heaven was coming here. Now, I could compare that a little bit to Zionist Zionist beliefs. They believe that God is going to bring his kingdom to this earth. It'll be established in Jerusalem, literally. Okay, so there's, there are still some, some remnants of that, of that idea still in society today. But sociologists and, and historians and, and anthropologists tell us that the, the roots of this concept of millennialism 
or utopianism can be traced through all the world, all the history of this world. Humans have always been looking for the best place to live. They've always been looking for that fountain of youth. <laughs> what God had promised that someday, as he said to Eve, there in the, after they sinned, he said to Eve that someday she would have a child and that child would crush the head of the serpent. Now, mixed in with the, the concept of millennialism is the idea of the victory of Christ. Christ was victorious over d darkness, death, and dying. And because he was victorious, then we as, as human beings then have hope. We can hold on to the promises of God's word. Now that, that in itself is not a new concept that Christ ushered in. Throughout the Old Testament, all of the prophets, all of the wisdom, all of the writings of the Old Testament, at some point in time, promised either a group of people, a nation, or the world, freedom from the oppression of sin and darkness and a better day. So it was, no, it was no wonder, with all the persecution that was going on in Europe, that people began to come and settle in America. And in fact, we know that even the migration of, of peoples and individuals began long before that. Sociologists, historians, anthropologists will tell us that people migrated from different parts of the earth, walked over the ice bridges, came down through the Americas, went on clear down to the South Americas. We know the Aztecs did not start in South America. They started up here on the East Coast. They followed the gold trail all the way to the South. So knowing that, we then realized that during the 1700s and 1800s, there was a tremendous optimism that just like a, like a, almost like a, a fire just burned throughout society. And this optimism, this whole idea of there's a better place to live and God's going to bring it to us, he promised us, became a religious thing. And it, and it began to permeate uh, all of the denominations uh, across the world, but more specifically here in America. And a beautiful, wonderful phenomena began during this time period. It's called... Um, the, the um, revivalism. Now, there have been many religious movements throughout history, and tremendous movements. All of those movements began mostly over in Europe, in that area, sometimes in parts of Asia. But revivalism is unique to North America. And because of the impression that it left on the rest of the world, it still is unique in America. And you say, well, how come we don't see a lot of it around today? Well, have any of you been to camp meeting? Okay, a few of you. Um, camp meeting is the last remnant, I guess you would say, of early revivalist movement in America. Okay? The idea that people would come from all over the country in their wagons and their carts or on horseback, and they would meet in one local centralized place. They would camp there for weeks, sometimes months. And then people would, ministers and, and lay people would get up and teach and, and preach to them, and they would, they would sing beautiful hymns. And they, it, was a, it was a beautiful experience. People became extremely, I, I would say, supercharged in a sense, um, and became excited about uh, worshiping God and about being part of a great um, religious movement. Now, I'm jumping in big steps through, through time here. So we come finally to this, this time period when William Miller, and he um, came on the scene suddenly, as, as um, Stan told us, a kind of an unwilling um, speaker. He wasn't, uh, wasn't a minister, wasn't a trained clergy, and yet he felt the power of God. The, the Holy Spirit was leading him forward, and he became the most popular <laughs> preacher on the East Coast, because that's all we had, well, East and Midwest. Um, and he went among churches preaching this whole new 
concept, and that was Jesus is coming to take us off the earth. Okay? You get the difference, okay? And he had lots of, well, people who, who fought against that concept and that idea, mainly the clergy and also um, professors at uh, Yale and Harvard and other places like that. But he prevailed. The message prevailed. People in America were ready for change. The, the society that we lived in during that time period was so, um, I guess you would call it in turmoil. A lot of change was taking place during this time period. Uh, Stan mentioned the War of uh, 1812, was it? Yes. Which, interesting, folks, I will say this. Excuse me if I just divert a little bit here. I found out that my, great, uh, my mother's great-great-uncle was Oliver Perry, one of the famous um, naval, com- what they call them, commodores. commodores. He, he was one of the men who fought the British in the Great Lakes, so maybe he was at that at that battle where William Miller was. But anyways, William Miller was a very, a very organized man, a very thoughtful man, a good Bible student, and he came to the conclusion that the text that you read, and actually several texts, but the main text that he wanted to point to was in Revelation. If you want to look in your Bibles, you'll, you'll see what we're talking about here. Revelation chapter 12. Now, I'm not going to read the whole, the whole passage, but in this, in this passage of Scripture, you see the very classic example of millennialism being, um, being written down. And the idea is the war, was it saved? Um, beginning with voice, uh, let's see. I'll just read from the beginning, chapter 12, Revelation 12. And a great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, With the moon under her feet and a crown of twelve stars on her head, she was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. And here it is, verse 4. And his tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them onto the earth. And the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Boom. There's your millennial, your millennial statement. Millennial, millennialist the, thinking and theology teaches that there is a future event, 50 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, 2,000 years. In the future, something huge is going to happen. You got it? Now let me tell you something. I have, I have worked among tr- different tribes over in, in Asia, and I have uh, even a relative of mine worked in New Guinea, some of the more primitive tribes. They all have millennial prophecies, all of them. Now, I understand even, even here in America, the, the American Indian tribes, some of them have a, a millennial, a visionary person who gave them a, a vision of what would happen in the future. So millennialism is very much a part of human thinking, all right? And it, was, it all goes, traces it right back to the Garden of Eden. So, so we have here a, a statement made by John, one of, by, by the way, one of the greatest millennial preachers, okay, writers. And he quotes who? The most. Daniel. John and Daniel, I mean, their, their writings, have, they, they bounce off of each other constantly. They're, they're like, like a, actually like a dovetail, okay? That's why we study Daniel and Revelation. Daniel also was a millennial preacher slash thinker slash writer. And he was foretelling things that would happen way up in the future, okay? Even to our day. Same thing with John. Here's what's, here's what's interesting, though, about, about millennialist um, uh, preaching and, and writing. It involves the present, sometimes the past, but it involves the present and the future. There are applications for the present, the day we live, you know, day by day living here on this earth, and then it talks about what event will take place in the future. Okay? So you understand then 
when you say, um, when I turn 65, I'm going to retire. Okay, that's a, that, in a sense, is sort of a prophecy. This is what is going to happen. And when, when I retire, this and this and this and this is going to have to fall into place. That's why I'm still preaching. I'm, not, I'm 67. <laughs> because all of the things haven't fallen into place, you see. But that is, in a sense, a prophecy. You are saying, in the future, this is what's going to happen. So when we read millennial preaching, millennial teaching, uh, we've lost signal. No? It came up here. There we go. Okay. I'll give you a prophecy right now. Pastor Glenn doesn't know how to use computers very well. <laughs> I'm old-fashioned. What can I say? I'd rather use smoke signals or, or, or the, what do they call the... Uh, uh, Morse code. <laughs> okay. Well, it'd be the next picture on that on that uh, program. You go ahead and work on it. I'll keep going here. So, so the as this group of individuals make their way to the top of this mountain, they're singing songs about the second coming of of Christ. <clears throat> oh, there we go. Okay. So, so. A part of that group, in that group, is this famous, popular evangelist, if you want to call him that, a millennialist preacher, and it's William Miller. This, by the way, is his house. It still stands today. Okay, And they've, they've repainted it and fixed it all up because now it's sort of like a, a, I call it a historical landmark, I guess you would call it. And people visit that all the time, and you can even go and take a visit there. But people must realize that this was a significant time period in the history of Christianity. And not just Christianity, but in the world in general. All right? Um, and so they made their way to the top of this mountain. The date was, you all know it, October 22, 1844. Now, there was a date set, 1843, but that was a big whoops. And so they, William put it off and said it's 1844. So they all made the way to the top. And why were they going to the top of the mountain? Why were they, why were they going to what we called Ascension Rock? No? Okay. No, that went too far. No, okay. Um, this, is, this is actually a Millerite um, crusade. <laughs> Look how many people there are. This went on for, for weeks, preaching the second coming, all right? Sometimes they would, we, they would meet months, depending on the, on the people and how much they wanted to drink of what the speaker had to say. In fact, in the 1700s, men like John Charles Wesley were involved in this, and these great preachers, and there are some sermons that have been passed down through the years. My great-grandfather was involved in some of this. Uh, it was great stuff. He was a Methodist preacher, Okay. And they all got caught up in, in, the, in the excitement of the second coming of Jesus. And the, the situation was that in the social fiber of the country and the political fiber of the country and the re revivalist fiber of the country, religious fiber, of the, and there, there were so many areas of everyday living that was affected that it, it was just like a big, huge movement of people. And um, they all believed it was time to elect a president that was not part of the social elite of Washington. You want to guess who that guy was? If you happen to be carrying a $20 bill, which I thought I had one for, the, for, for this. Oh, somebody knows his money. Andrew Jackson. There he is was the first commoner, elected president that was a commoner. He was not part of the Washington, they have another name for Washington for the last few decades, I won't use it, but it was not part of, of the elite group that kept passing the baton to each other. It was now a vote of the people, and it was from the people. The second one was who? Abraham Lincoln. Okay, so now you know a little bit of history. So Andrew Jackson 
on his platform as he ran for president, said this very interesting, this was his platform. Let me just read it to you so you know it's not Pastor Munson using his own words. Let's just read this here. <clears throat> and I'm not going to read the whole thing. But his, his statement or his, the content of what he was preaching or, or speaking about when he was running for president was this. That America must have a state, must reach a state of a perfect society. Listen to this. A perfect, the word perfect, underlined. And he said, that is the mission of America. Okay? Not only that, but he, he also went on to say that we can so perfect both the social and the secular and the religious environment that we will indeed become a perfect nation. Well, <clears throat> that was several hundred, well, not several hundred, but that was a long time ago he said that. Do we have a perfect nation? Will we ever have a perfect nation? Not as long as humans are running it, okay? So you, you see that society during that time period was very, um, it, it was ready for, it was ripe and ready for something new to come along. It was ready to move forward. And so out, here came William Miller preaching a better society, better world, the coming of Jesus, and that became sort of like the, the platform that the presidents uh, ran on. Um, during that time period, there was what we call religious ferment among denominations. Uh, Methodist, Baptist, Lutheran, um, and so on. And Catholicism, but Catholicism didn't have a big representation in America during that time. And so um, you will find, if you study the history of these, de these main Protestant denominations, that from that time on, there was a lot of ferment, and many of them split into many different factions. You have an East and West Coast, Lutheran Synod, you have Southern Baptists and First Baptists and Reformed Baptists and you name it, okay? Same thing with, uh, with the Methodists. But during this time period, there were many um, commune movements. I'm going to call them, com they called them communists, but that was before Karl Marx. And it was based on the idea, once again, that we could build a, a utopian society, a perfect society. And some of you, may know a little bit about this time period. If you collect antique furniture, you have the Shakers. Shaker furniture is the most expensive American furniture, I believe, that you can buy, if you can find one. Okay? But that was started by a group of people that got together and said, we're going to form a perfect society, a commune. You all thought communes started in the 60s, right? No, <laughs> that's an old idea. Then also you had Oneida. James Humphrey Noah's Oneida community. How many of you have Oneida, uh, Oneida silverware? No? Okay, Oneida silverware, they still make silverware, but it started as a commune, a religious movement. So they, these movements went on to become cults. And so there's huge, huge movement in northern uh, New York um, state, and these groups were moving out into the woods and, and building these, these ideal societies, these perfect utopian societies. From that time period, that explosion, I call it, of, of movements and communes and cults, came three very strong uh, movements. And I'm going to tell you about those as we move through these pictures. This is Ascension Rock, not far from the Miller's farm. It's, um, it's on top of a hillside. And this history tells us it's where many of the people went to wait for Jesus to come on October 22, 19, or 1844. There are a lot of stories, some of them myths, some of them truthful. People came here, some of them groups came in white robes. They were trying to get ahead of the Lord, you know. <laughs> so I'm going to wear my own white robe, Lord. Thanks anyways, I don't need yours. And many of them came, um, had, had sold their farms, their homes, their businesses. Some of the farmers left their crops. This was in the fall, so they left their crops un, unattended. And the potatoes rotted in the ground, and the fruit trees, the trees fell, or the apples fell on the ground and rotted. They left everything behind because they believed Jesus was coming. They got to the top of this hill. They waited. The sun finally came up. They kept singing. 
He kept shouts of glory, glory, glory. Those were the Methodists. Um, well, they called them shouting Methodists. Ellen White was part of that group. Yes, she was saying glory, glory, glory. She said it all through her life. Before and after, after her visions, she hung on to her Methodist roots, shouting Methodist roots. Very interesting. Glory, glory, glory. Okay, Proclaiming God's glory and praising God with the, with the top of their lungs. And so we had an interesting group. Now, some of them on, on other hillsides literally came with their foot lockers and tied ropes to the foot lockers and then to, the, to their ankles. Interesting group, huh? Ask yourself, which group are you in? <laughs> they wanted to take with them their earthly belongings just in case they got ejected up into the sky. This would come with them. Now, if you know anything about uh, propulsion and you were being ejected into the sky, well, the trunk, you know, if you happen to stop at any point, the trunk's going to catch up and, <laughs> and, and hit you. <laughs> I tried that once. We did it. We, as kids, we were really stupid. Um, we, we thought we, we were getting bored with typical water skiing, you know, behind a boat, and we decided we'd try using a bungee cord. And um, that, was, that was a catastrophe because when the boat slowed down, you just kept right on going, slingshot right past the boat and almost hit the boat. The idea, though, that you could bring what you had on this earth was totally contrary to the Word of God. Okay? Now, the problem that that eventually turned it into the great disappointment is that the calculations that William Miller had calculated, he, his calculations were right, but the, end, the, final, the final result or what, what was to happen was the wrong thing. Okay? And they thought Jesus was coming, but as we found out later, and we don't have time today to cover this, but they found out later that it was actually... Christ moving into the most holy place and, and doing his, his priestly um, ministry in the most holy place. But that's, that's a whole other sermon. This is about what led this group. And so religious revivalism was big. Social reform was a huge thing. It eventually led to the prohibition and all these things that went on. Uh, vegetarianism. Uh, by the way, vegetarianism came along quite a while before um, the early Advent movement. Uh, you got a good start under the, under the uh, leadership of a man by the, by the name of Graham. You recognize it? How many of you, how many of you like s'mores? Nobody's going to confess. Nobody's going to confess. S'mores have graham crackers on them, right? Well, he was the inventor, but he, was a vet, he, was, he preached vegetarianism. He was a former preacher and became a health, um, a man who brought uh, revival to, to the health and, and the, to the terrible um, habits the American people had, how they ate, you need to read. It's, it was terrible how they ate. It's much worse than how we eat even today. I mean, it's bad. But he brought um, the message of healthful living. And then, of course, I talked about the political reform, which began by Jackson, Andrew Jackson. And then we had, of course, the huge machinery of the Industrial Revolution grinding along. Now, let me tell you something. The, the concept of utopianism throughout history has always been in conflict with the natural flow and ebb of, of natural history. Okay? And when I say naturalist, I mean just the tribals or the tribes or the nations or the governments or the wars or whatever. And so anytime utopianism or anytime millennialism comes up, sticks its head up, um, it is always seen as in conflict with it. But for the first time, under Miller, William Miller, it, it was able to somehow blend itself with a lot of the change that went on, and it used the energy of all these movements in America, social, political, industrial, and it carried it along. Just for your own uh, present um, identity, identification, um, how many of you do not use, in any way, shape, or form, technology, high technology, modern technology? Okay. So I would say almost all of you have a cell phone that can access in unimaginable information that you can never imagine how much information is out there. You also may have a computer at home, and you may drive a car that has a computer chip in it. 
Now, I'm not going to get into this. There's a whole other lecture. What we have been through in the last 40 years in America and around the world is a repeat of 1840s. It's a repeat. Sociologists have pointed that out. Scientists, uh, they know what they're doing. And we, have, we are repeating exactly what has happened many times before as history moves along. By the way, history is not a straight line. It is not a straight line. History is a loop that keeps repeating itself all the way back to the garden. Okay? That's why when Jesus said in Matthew 24, here he gives you a list of all the things that will take place. And every generation, by the way, that is a millennialist um, statement that Jesus made. Wars, rumors of wars, you know, he goes on and on, prophets, false prophets, false Christ. How many times has that been repeated since the first century? Pestilences, plagues, um, earthquakes, famines. Go back in your Bible and study from the time of Jesus forward and study your, your secular history and you will see that they, they go side by side. Over and over and over, they loop around and around. The disciples believed that Christ would come in their time. My grandfather, who, who died at 93 years old, believed. And I told you this before. I said, Grandpa, you know, he was raised during this time period, okay, that I'm talking about. He was, he was born in the late 1800s, but his parents taught him and his siblings that they were not to get married because Christ was coming. The, the daughter, the one daughter, chose to follow that teaching, and she never got married. She was a Bible worker in, in uh, Loma Linda Hill Church for all of her life. Then my grandfather and his two brothers, all, they got married. They kept the promise not to have children, but my grandfather somehow, <laughs> I, I believe it was because grandma was a real spicy lady, um, decided they would have children. Two girls, okay? And when my mother passed away a few years ago, that was the end of the Bowers family. Okay, family line. Okay. So they, he was raised in the millennial, millennialist thinking, the utopian thinking. And so it's, to me it's very interesting as I read this, the books and different um, uh, material on that time period, I can see it in my grandfather. And I saw it fulfilled in my grandfather's uh, thinking and his belief system. So the, um, to build a society, a nation that is perfect and religious, both religiously and socially, was what they taught during this time period. And that's why we had so many different um, movements going on. So, uh, by the way, the Salvation Army was one of the movements that also began in the 1840s. And um, they made a choice to become a social gospel preacher rather than an apocalyptic preaching church or an um, Advent preaching church. Um, and so they're still alive. I use them all the time. This shirt was bought, <laughs> Salvation Army. Okay, so, so they decided to go into the community and find areas where there's people struggling with alcohol issues or people that needed clothing and food and all these. They chose that route. Um, whereas Methodist, Baptist, um, Lutheran, um, they, they chose the route of just, you know, preaching the, the, the gospel. But they still helped also. Now, we also here have um, outreach into the community for people um, who are in need. And that's because we kind of shared a little bit of the ideas of the Salvation Army. And we've kept that alive in our community services. So we are truly a reflection of that time period and it was the foundation. Now, I'm going to go quickly here because Ruthie's going to share us a little bit about our church here and, and its history. Because history is a very important thing. By the way, if you forget your history, you will lose track of your future. Now, people have said that in many different ways. Okay, But we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear lest we forget how God has led us in the past. Who said that? Uh, and she got it from someone before that. <laughs> Wesley. <laughs> and Wesley got it from 
<laughs> someone before that. By the way, talking about Ellen, Ellen White and the early Adventists and Miller, borrowing concepts and ideas from other writers and other preachers and other schools of thought, um, excuse me, that is not, that is not plagiarism. Okay? Because, as a pastor, I can assure you that every time I stand up here, there's been a lot of reading, a lot of taking notes, a lot of assimilating ideas and concepts from other people. Therefore, I am a, a plagiarist, if you want to call me that. <laughs> but the fact is, and somebody argued with me, someone by the name of Walter Ray argued with me over that. And I said, well, the older man, I wanted to respect him. He too was a minister. I said, well, when was the last time you had an original thought? Anybody, anybody here had an original thought this morning? Everything that you are and everything that you think comes from what you've learned in the past, what your parents taught you, what your teachers taught you, what society taught you. But as Christians, there's just a nice place there that says the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. I hope. Okay, because that's, that's the rudder. <laughs> that's what steers us through the, the mishmash of thought and ideas and theology and people's concepts, because the Holy Spirit is what keeps us on the path and keeps us going down the right path. As I've said before, there's plenty of rabbit holes we can go down. There's plenty of, as HMS Richards would say, there's plenty of, there's plenty of the devil's dogs to chase. But if you stay connected to God's word and listen to the Holy Spirit, you will not waver. Luther, as I've said before, Luther said that Christians are like drunks on a donkey. They either, up in the le- either end up in the left ditch or the right ditch. And so as we walk through life, we need to listen to the Spirit and its leading. Now, we're going to go a little long today. Anybody can leave anytime they want. <laughs> But we have a wonderful planned service here that has to do with history. The the millennial um, theology teaches, all right, and it starts in Revelation chapter 12, that the Bible's view of Christ's triumph over Satan is, is the foundation of it. And then the second thing is the vindication of suffering saints, okay? And then third would be the eventual reign of Christ on the earth. Those three things, remember them, okay? There are many variations of that. And they ask these questions. Is Christ, when is Christ coming? Is it near or is it far off? Every single generation has asked that question. I am four generations into millennialist thinking as an Adventist minister. And I'm still asking that question. Is it near or is it far off? And guess what? Don't, I don't mean this in a, in a disrespectful way. But my Bible tells me there's only one power, one entity in this entire universe that knows the answer to that question. And who is it? Thank you very much. Even Jesus and the Holy Spirit do not know when the Father is going to say, Okay, son, (laughs) go for it. And Jesus is going to get on that white horse and he's going to gallop out through that per, those pearly gates out into the universe with thousands and hundreds and millions. I don't know how many of angels are going to follow him. And they're coming to this earth. And my Bible tells me that he's going to appear in the clouds of heaven. Every eye shall see him. What if somebody says, hey, he's out in Palm Springs uh, at the airport. You can go see him. What are you going to do? Don't go. Or, or, he, or he's going to be at the Marriott. Um, you know, in L.A., and, and, and he's going to be giving a speech. Don't go. Every eye will see him. As the lightning flashes from the, from the east to the west, every eye around the world will try to pull that one off. Oh, I know people that say, well, of course, everybody has a cell phone around the world. And they could put it on the Internet or on the cell phone. No, that's not what my Bible says. Every eye will visually see him coming in the clouds of heaven. That, folks, is the final end of millennialist thinking and theology. And it begins the beginning of a whole new era for the universe and for the world specifically. 
And that is we spend eternity, eternity with Jesus. And all the things that, that we get tied up in and all the rabbit holes that we go down and all the devil's dogs that we chase, they won't exist because we follow Jesus. And we believe in the coming of Jesus in the clouds of heaven. The angel said to the disciples, as you have seen him go into the clouds, you will also see him come back. His feet will never touch this earth. So much for all the cult leaders that claim to be Jesus, including one by the name of Wayne Bent uh, that I have met. Um, this, they, they are not the true Messiah, the, the true Son of God, Jesus Christ, is not going to ever touch this earth again. It's too polluted. It's too messed up. Hallelujah. He's taken us away. He's going to create us a new body. You know, I'd be happy just for a new mind. <laughs> He's going to give us a new body. I'll take that too, Lord. <laughs> I got some scars and my hips hurt. And yeah, okay. He's going to take all that and we are going to be fresh, new, recreated, re restored in the image of God that we have perverted and twisted for so many thousands of years. We will be, at that moment, perfect. Okay? Praise God. Perfect not only in physical, but mental and spiritual. But we're, we're, we're going to be perfect because God, with his own hands, recreates us into the beings that he once knew in the garden. And that's beautiful. Okay, so modern millennialism. Oh, I'm just going to touch on this real quick, and then Ruthie's going to come up. Next week, I'm gonna, or next time I'm here, I'm going to continue this a little bit because there's a lot more, but I'm going to go to the next picture. There's James White. He's using the old chart that even now, today, we use one very similar to that. I have one in my garage. There they are, fairly young, James and Ellen. Um, this is the uh, the first church. I yeah, this is Stan. Is that the first church? Oh, that okay. You're right. And uh, yeah, okay. Here they are in their family. Young Edson. Yeah, the little guy. This is James when he was a little older. I like that look. You can see my beard's not quite long enough, but I'm, I'm there. Stan's Stan's doing a better job. By the way, when did they say that long hair and beards was, was nicks for men? Do you know your history? World War II. World War II. Everybody came back with uh, jar head cuts. There she is, young. Oh, by the way, I want you ladies to notice. What color is the clothing that she's wearing? Well, this picture makes it look brown, but it's more of a, a burgundy. Okay. What does she have around her neck? She has a white collar. What does she have in the middle there? A brooch. Interesting. Be careful. <clears throat> if, you, if you decide that the, that's not the way you want to dress, then you're going to start looking like a Quaker or a Puritan, which they said, if you dress a certain way, um, then you're not part of our, our little group. The Quakers and Puritans, how many of you know about the blue laws of Connecticut? The blue laws were established to, to enforce, we don't like that word nowadays, do we? To make you comply to one religious set of beliefs. And one of the things that you were not to do as a Puritan, you were not to walk further than a couple of miles to church. So they all lived around the church. You were not to ride a horse on Sabbath because that was pleasure. Um, you were not to hold hands with your wife on Sabbath. You were, by all means, never to kiss your wife on Sabbath. And you're saying, well, th this is all silliness. No, I have a book of court cases where a woman, her husband, was a sea captain. He was out at sea for, I think, over a year. And he came back on Sabbath. She ran down, threw her arms around him, and kissed him. She was punished severely for that. Her hands were tied in front of her. She was tied to an ox cart, and she was led through town as they whipped her. This is a court case that is documented. I can name many others, like 
putting holes through your tongue, for saying a profane word. It goes on and on and on. Thank God we don't run our country that way anymore. There are countries that are run that way. <laughs> Look at the news, okay? But we decided not to. But, he, but here's what's interesting. Yeah. Okay, and so, and so remember this. Remember this, that Luther said, intolerance begats intolerance. So as Christians, as followers of Christ, we are not to carry on the intolerance, that we are to, to heal the brokenhearted, we are to bring love, and we are to help those who are struggling. So millennial, modern millennials, let me give you some examples. And, and this is in their speeches or their writings. President Wilson, he, he started what was called New Freedom. Look it up. Roosevelt, the Great New Deal. This is all millennials thinking, folks. New Deal, New Freedom. Kennedy, New Frontier, Space. Now they're looking for utopia, right? Yeah, Pancho, the list goes on. Um, how, about, how about Trump? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, make America great. That's millennials thinking. How about Biden? The New Green Deal. Well, he isn't totally in charge of that. But what I'm trying to show you is it exists today in our thinking. Whenever we say what we have isn't good enough, we need something better, that is utopian thinking. That is millennialist thinking. Okay? <laughs> no, we're, we're thinking everybody. Because around the world, I've lived in so many different countries, we all as humans think the same way, and it's very interesting, okay? So the idea of, of um, utopian or millennialist or the idea that, um, you know, I can find a better place to live is, as we know, a hopeless cause because we live in a world of sin and suffering and pain. And man's inhumanity to man is atrocious. It's atrocious, no matter where you look. That's why we are looking for that day of Jesus coming. And we are called then Seventh-day Adventists. The word Advent comes from the Bible, the Advent of Christ. So we are Adventists. And there are Catholic Adventists, there are, there are Lutheran, there are Baptists, there are Methodists, who believe in the advent of Christ. So we don't have a corner on that one. Now, Ruthie, come on up. Oh, I want to just look a couple more here as we go through. There's their family when they're a little bit older. That's Edson and Willie. Willie in the middle. This is a camp meeting. And if you look, there's a man in the middle with beard and the white hair. And if you look to his right, you'll see Ellen White. She's very young there. By the way, look how she's a little tiny lady. <laughs> Recall. No, she's not sitting. She's standing. She's standing. Um, there, here's a group of, of some of the early... Oh boy, what did I do? Here's a group of some of the early um, uh, men of that time period. Here's a picture of uh, family. Again, I believe here is the general conference. Speaking at the General Conference, here's another one of the General Conference, the same one. I'm... Okay, here's, here's family. This is Willie White's family. Willie's the guy with the goatee like mine. Um, nice family, huh? Grandkids. This is one of the oldest pictures. Um, I'm sorry, not the oldest, but this is the most recent photograph found of Ellen. Um, however, it, it was one of the last pictures taken of her. And around, this I believe was uh, 1913 or something. No, it was before that. Anyways, early 1900s. This is the dedication of Loma Linda. Do you see her standing there? Okay. The, the hospital was on the hill at that time. It was a resort that was going out of business, and they made a good deal. <laughs> now the hospital is down in the valley, where the earth shakes and quakes. And so they had to spend a lot of money recently to make it so it wouldn't uh, sink into the, into the uh, sand. This is, once again, the family. Um, this is, uh, we got the Robison twins, the two little boys down there. Became world traveler slash photographers, traveled all over the world. Um, we have uh, 
Edson, uh, Willie Edson and his wife, and the Robinson family. Here's one of the last pictures of her in a carriage, which I believe the horse was sold to her by my wife's grandfather, a great-grandfather, I'm sorry, and from Healdsburg, an, an Irish immigrant who uh, had, a, had a little farm and also raised uh, carriage horses. Um, this picture I like especially. Um, you can see the family, the little girl in the white. The little girl in the white, that's Grace Jacques, who I became friends with while she was in her early 80s, and she told me a lot of really cool stories that I'd be glad to share with you, but I don't have time. Down the little girl in the middle where Ellen White is. See her? Just all you can see is her, her head. Um, and then if you see the old guy in the back that looks a little bit like me, has glasses on, he's got a white goatee, and he's got white hair, and he's got a shiny top. That's my, that's my great-grandfather. So I like this picture. He, was, uh, he worked for Ellen White. Um, he was a Methodist who became, it's a long story, became a, a Seventh-day Adventist, but he was a Methodist preacher, graduated from Oberlin University when it first was founded by Finney and others. And um, it's a long story. Anyways, this is just a, just a taste of our history, folks. And, of course, this is her um, funeral at um, the Battle Creek uh, Tabernacle. And the rest is history, and we pick up, at this point, we pick up the story of the Yucca Seventh-day Adventist Church, <laughs> and Ruthie, our head elder, is going to take it from here and share. You want to use this mic? Okay. Yeah, right close. <laughs> now, can you hear me? Can you understand what I'm saying? Okay, fine. Well, as they say, this is kind of a hard thing to follow. You know, that's thinking way back. Well, let's kind of come forward to 1967. This church was built with a lot of love. And I feel that it has had a lot of love through all the years that we've, we've had this church. We've had some hard times, but we've moved on as of right now. I believe at this time, if I'm not wrong, uh, you know, we've lost so many folks this last couple of years. And I believe Bev is our oldest member. This is Stan's mother. Her health is such that she doesn't attend at this time. But I hate to say, or maybe I do like to say, that I come next. Still pushing on, but I come next, I think. So I think some of these things that I tell you about this church and how it came to be is coming from a father, it's coming from many, many histories that have gone wrong that I have some information I'd like to share with you. After meeting for some time in a town, the town mortuary, the members decided it was time to build a church structure where they could worship and hold functions, such as evangelistic meetings, a place for children, Sabbath school, perhaps a place where they could have a community service outreach, and of course, a place where they could hold fellowship meals. You know, like eat graham crackers and russets and, and cornflakes. Yeah, cornflakes right. I believe that came from way back, as we were just told. <laughs> um, but what I would like to tell you is that they wanted to move on. And so they had this property de donated to them. Wow. So in 1967, this began to be a reality when they broke ground and started building this sanctuary. The beauty of this project was that they did not have a large contractor build it. That wasn't something that was required at that time. And so, Excuse me. 
So as they were, uh, there were many, many volunteers who had the talents to do this job, uh, and they were willing to give up their time as well as their money. It was all right in those days not to have a permit for every little thing. Many folks who had a talent of some kind pitched in. Now there was a doctor, it was Dr. Haysmere. He was a very, very well-known doctor in this area where if you go up Choya, there is a, 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 a place, I guess you would call it for seniors, that was the hospital here in Yucca Valley, and he was head of that hospital. But he was also an Adventist. And so he was willing to not only help financially, but help physically, which was wonderful. So you can see that people were willing to use all their talents and their time. Uh, Ed Griswold, who was an electrician as well as a retired sound production man, who had been working in Pinder Town making movies and TV programs, he learned to love this community. He had just re-become a Seventh-day Adventist. He had been a Seventh-day Adventist as a child and as a young man. But he moved full-time to Yucca Valley. But he was also my father. Then as they reached the time to start painting, my nephew, who was not an Adventist, but was a painter, offered his spare time to paint the church. So his crew would come in and give up their time to paint the church. As there were many, many offering hands and the constru construction moved right along, the sanctuary wing Along, the Sabbath, along with the Sabbath school ring was finished first. It wasn't long till they started the fellowship hall, which is where you're sitting, and the kitchen, which is right behind us, <clears throat> and a large room, excuse me, the other side of the kitchen, which was used for community service outreach room. Their dreams were starting to take effect and their membership beginning to grow. At one time, the conference stated that Yucca Valley Community Services was the most effective and equipped that, is, that was in the Southeastern California Conference. The room that is behind the kitchen was community room, community service. There is a little place underneath. There is a loft in there, and so underneath that is uh, what we now use for a storage place, but that was also where they kept much of the furniture. They said they could be able to furnish a home completely if someone was burnt out. Mm -hmm. Anything that they would need, they had here. They had as many men working in community service as they did women. And so believe me, it was really a, a going church. Uh, okay, we're man now equipped and ready to give people. Okay. Uh, once the church was completed, it was ready for dedication. And that was really a special time. <clears throat> As my father was not only the person that ran the sound system, he was also the treasurer. Now, do you think maybe that kind of came along? Yeah. He was a treasure. I'm a treasure. My daughter is a treasure for a church. <laughs> they didn't learn, or none of us learned much, did we? Um, so when the pastor, when they had the, ded the dedication of the church, so when the pastor asked him, Ed, bring forward the mortgage so we can burn the mortgage. And my father said, Pastor, you know this church never had a mortgage. This was a church that was built with love and funds as we needed them. Now that's a working church. That was a real accomplishment. We remodeled the sanctuary in 2002 
And once again, the Lord blessed us as we took out a seven-year loan from the conference to build us, to remodel the church. We paid it off in two years. Is that love? Is that God's leading? We also were holding two services the Sabbath. Where have all the people gone? We're going to pray harder and harder and harder to bring back some of these folks that have decided to stay home, especially since the pandemic. Let's stay home and watch the service. We don't have to get dressed up. We can just sit back and, and watch it from home. Maybe we've kind of spoiled folks with giving them all of this. So if you know of anyone that is doing that, please encourage them. We're going to open up that sanctuary very soon. And is it better? No, I think it's, it's no better than what it was. It's fresh and clean and all. But the same love, the same pastor that's here is going to be the pastor over there. The members that are here, the visitors that are here, they're going to be over there, right? And we're going to bring more folks in because Christ is in that sanctuary. He has been there since the first thought of putting that sanctuary there. And I am very, very, very proud to be the oldest member. I'm very, very proud to have the history that this church has given to all of us. So when we move back in, we don't want to sit back and say, okay, the job's done. I'm not needed. I can just sit here and listen to what's being said. Uh-uh. God needs every single one of us to do his work. So when we have a nominating committee meeting and your name is brought up, be ready to say, yes, I will be glad to take this position because it's, it's work, but it's fun. It's good to know your, your member as a, as a friend, as a person that you know. And as you can kind of tell, I love this church. I love it with all my heart. And I'm proud to be here. I don't know how much longer the good Lord plans on me being here, but as long as I'm on my feet, which is kind of hard these days, I'll be here. So with all of God's blessings for this church, which is beyond measure, let's at this time keep praying for this church and for new members to come back old members to come back, new ones to come in. May God bless us all, for he loves us. At this time, I'd like the pastor to give us a prayer. Ruthie, I think it'd be appropriate if we just uh, sang the, the closing hymn, which is, We Have This Hope, 214. And Martha's going to play the piano for us. We'll sing both, uh, both of the stanzas. Jesus said, you know, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. There's your millennial <laughs> prophecy. He's coming again. And this song was written by Wayne Hooper, who um, I know personally, and, and God really used him to write a beautiful, beautiful song. We have this hope that burns within our hearts, hope in the coming of the Lord. We have this faith that Christ alone imparts, faith in the promise of His word. When the nations far and near shall awake and shout and sing, 
Hallelujah, Christ is King. We have this hope that burns within our hearts. Hope in the coming of the Lord. We are united in Jesus Christ our Lord. We are united in His love. Love for the waiting people of the world. Faithful who greet our Savior's love. Soon the heaven will open wide. Christ will come to claim his bride. All in your verse will sing, Hallelujah, Christ is King. We have this hope, this faith, and God's gift. And Heavenly Father, we look forward to that great, grand, and glorious day that you will come in the clouds of heaven and you will take your children home with you. That will be the most beautiful, beautiful experience that we will ever experience. We look forward to that, Father. Help us each day to remember that we are your children. We pray this in your most precious and holy name. Amen. Amen.